Hi. How's everyone doing? Uh, so this is going to be a bit of an odd threat analysis talk. Um, to sort of summarize, this is the story of uh, how I ended up reading 20 years worth of documentation on cyber norms at the UN to try to understand how nation states hack and why. Uh, this is probably the most painful way to do threat analysis I have ever found, and I do not recommend it. Um, but anyway, fun lessons learned. Okay, so my name is Mara. Uh, I live and work in that part of the world. Uh, I believe the first time I ever made this gag was here during my second day keynote last year. And I promise you that it is much, much worse. Um, so I'm really glad to be back in Heidelberg uh, in our hacker sanctuary city. <laughs> Whoop. Uh, so this is what I do in my, my life at home. Uh, you know, that's me on the far end. Uh, that's actually with uh, Greg Conti uh, at SciCon US, which is a, a joint um, NATO and Army Cyber Institute conference that's held in Washington, DC. Uh, and funnily enough, this year, uh, SciCon was used by one of our favorite threat actors <laughs> in a phishing campaign <laughs> um, to drop uh, a new version of Sednet, uh, just to do really dickish reconnaissance. Um, so that was APT28, AKA Fancy Bear, AKA Sofasi, or SAR Team, Pawn Storm, pick your favorite flavor. <laughs> um, now, uh, I should say, we're gonna make a point of not just calling them Fancy Bear or Sofasi, we're gonna make a point of actually affiliating them to their sponsor agency, which is the GRU, or Russian Military Intelligence. Um, part of the motivation behind this talk is that I started getting really, really annoyed with firms doing kind of half-assed attribution, uh, just sort of walking that line of attributing to a nation state enough to get the bump in marketing, but not quite enough to piss off the state in question. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is gonna be a little bit less diplomatic than the last time I was here. Uh, <laughs> you're like, woo. <laughs> Burn it down. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're going to explain the pretentious title. We're going to take a little trip to the cyber circus. We're going to do some whataboutism, uh, talk about some bears, and also talk about what we do about all of this mess. Um, and because this is Troopers, this is the first time I've given this talk. Uh, so it's probably not going to be super clean, but you know, I bring new things to troopers because you guys are the best audience to bounce new ideas off of. <laughs> so this is No Royal Road. Uh, this, this comes from uh, the beginning of the French translation to Das Kapital from 1872. And the English version is here. There is no royal road to science, and only those who do not dread the fatiguing climb of its steep paths have a chance of gaining its luminous summits. Or, as Harun Mir said, hard things are hard. <laughs> um, and you know, part of the reason that I ended up wading through miles and miles of UN documents is because hard things are hard. And doing it right means doing it thoroughly and not compromising on that. So one of the things I will be doing probably at the end of this week around Friday is uploading a repository to GitHub of all of the UN documents that I was able to find on the history of cyber norms at the UN, uh, which was, <laughs> if I save anybody from doing that work again, uh, I, will, I will be really happy. Um, anyway, uh, on to the circus. So I like quoting smart people that I agree with. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes from recent memory. And this is Thomas Dillian or Halvar Flake from Black Hat Asia. Uh, this was last year. So all offensive problems are technical problems and all defensive problems are political problems. Now, Halvar is absolutely right, um, but offense should be a political problem and part of the issue right now is that it isn't. <laughs> Uh, and what I mean by that is that we don't really have, aside from maybe Australia starting to, uh, 
we don't really have any nation states that are taking ownership of their offensive actions and setting out clear interpretations of international law, setting out clear programs of um, how they perceive certain actions, what sort of responses one might expect if one commits those actions. Um, all of that is sort of in the dark right now. Uh, so Halvar is right, but it's also worse, which is not exactly optimistic, but um, so we like to think that cyber norms or nation state hacking, like this is relatively new stuff, like nation states going wild seems to be something that maybe started, a lot of people use uh, Stuxnet as a starting point, um, but Stuxnet is way too late. Uh, we like using Stuxnet because it involved nuclear things uh, and it involved nation states, so that's like two out of three of the cyber triple threat, like if something had blown up, that would have been even better. <laughs> uh, but there was a Russian operation that predated that one, actually. Uh, there was a Russian operation against a, a Ukrainian nuclear facility. Um, so it's a little bit disingenuous to say that Stuxnet started it all. I think nation states have always been behaving badly in this space. and. Uh, I am going to rag on Kaspersky a little bit later, but uh, some of the great researchers um, presented some really good work last year tracing the, uh, the history of the Moonlight Maze campaign and doing forensic analysis linking that all the way forward to sort of the Turla campaigns of the, of the present day. Um, and their point was it's not just the Equation Group or the United States that have been doing this consistently for going on two decades continuously. Uh, but another point that they didn't make is that it is possible to do that kind of forensic work, even that deep into the past. So I think we tend to take it as a point of convenience that attribution is hard when we want it to be hard. And sometimes attribution is easy when that is convenient too. And being a little bit more honest with ourselves about that is probably, you know, step one is admitting we have a problem. <laughs> and then step two is doing something about it. Um, so when I say 20 years in the making, I also mean that this has been on the international stage formally for 20 years. The first time that this was introduced, uh, and by this I mean um, information and communications technologies in the context of international security, first time that was introduced at the UN in the form of a resolution uh, was in September of 1998. It was introduced by the Russian delegation, uh, <laughs> by Sergei Lavrov, uh, back when he was at the UN. Um, <laughs> and uh, Russia has been introducing resolutions on information and communications technologies in the context of international security pretty much every year for the last 20 years. Um, and there's a little bit of strange and unfortunate diplomatic history that I'll talk about later. So some states are actively pouring fuel on this fire and are benefiting actively from the fact that we do not have sort of a regular program of international norms in this space. Um, some of the people who are benefiting from this are also Russia, also DPRK, um, and also criminal groups, frankly. Um, criminal groups do profit from the fact that as nation states we have not been able to get our act together. Uh, to give you an idea of how, <laughs> of how profoundly we have not gotten our act together, in 20 years at the UN, uh, the United States and Russia have not been able to come to an agreement that we will not cyber each other's nuclear shit. Like, in terms of norms, one would think that that is a minimum viable one that everyone could agree is a good idea, and we haven't been, like, we haven't even been able to do that. So that's... This is sort of what the UN has done for the last 17 or 18 years. Um, and almost every major player in this game, uh, from the European Union to the United States to the Russian Federation to China, um, everybody has been wrong <laughs> at some point. Uh, one of the sort of, something that I understood intellectually but not didn't really understand what it meant was that uh, information and communications technologies uh, were in the first committee at the UN. And first committee is the Committee on International Security and Disarmament. First committee is where you talk about nuclear treaties. It's where you talk about actual hot conflicts. Uh, it's where in 2004, 
uh, we decided to set, we, the United States, decided to set fire to the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, uh, just for lols, because John Bolton does that in his spare time. Uh, and what you, what I didn't understand until I actually started reading the transcripts of sessions in First Committee is that you would have, say, like the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty going up in flames, and then somebody would say, hang on, we need to talk about computers for a second. And then they would go back to talking about some armed crisis in South Sudan. Uh, so the, the disconnect at times was quite jarring. And I got the sense from reading these documents that for many people in the first committee or for many countries in the first committee, information and communications technologies were simply like an odd hobby that they shared for some reason that the Russians kept talking about and nobody really knew why. And so for years, you had representatives of the European Union and of the United States complaining that this had no place in the first committee because it wasn't really relevant to international security. Um, and all of that changed <laughs> after interference in Estonia and Georgia. So after that, the European Union sent a representative, and all of a sudden it was a very different tune. It was, this absolutely belongs in first committee. This is the appropriate place to discuss these matters. Um, and the United States sort of swung around eventually, but the fact that there was disagreement procedurally for at least 15 years um, really sort of hindered movement of this through the UN. Things have actually gotten slightly better. Um, I'm not expecting anything great to happen anytime soon, but uh, it's, it's less of a garbage fire than it has been in the past. So outside of the United Nations, um, <laughs> I'm gonna have like a quick review of bad ideas in cyber policy. Uh, and yeah, that's a cyber pirate. Uh, <laughs> so, among the really bad ideas in cyber policy are, uh, aside from the norms we don't have yet, are export controls, which uh, I've spent way more of my life working on than I care to admit or want to remember, um, namely the cryptography and intrusion software controls. Um, I'm sure some of you have come across those. Uh, in the United States, we have been discussing hacking back a fair bit, um, which, <laughs> you know, cyber letters of mark and reprisal. Uh, the funny thing about cyber letters of mark and reprisal is that we did away, well, all states did away with real letters of mark and reprisal by about the end of the 18th century because it only took that long for us to realize that it was a horrible idea. Um, there's, <laughs> there's this kind of romantic idea that, you know, a good guy with a worm is the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a worm. Uh, that doesn't really work that way, though. Um, and the other thing that we've got uh, that I think is various countries have picked this up at various times um, with varying degrees of commitment, but this idea that um, we should have a definition of armed conflict that lowers the legal threshold in order to encompass cyber operations. Um, the, the law of armed conflict only applies in times of armed conflict. An armed conflict is not a metaphor. It, it actually means people trying to deprive one another of the right to life. Um, there's, there's nothing figurative about it. It means like a situation in which people are trying to kill each other. Uh, and there, there is a school of thought that says that we should alter the bar for what counts as the law of armed conflict in order to encompass operations that happen in information space. Uh, I personally think this is a really terrible idea uh, because as soon as you enter that realm where the law of armed conflict applies, you have, think you have the possibility of escalation up a kinetic ladder, um, which is the, the same escalatory ladder that you use when you are actually trying to, when you are in a kinetic conflict. So I think uh, keeping those two things separate is probably a good idea, but other people disagree. Um, so. In terms of how policy actually works, if we're not talking about cyber privateers, um, it looks a bit more like this. It's actually very boring, uh, as, one, as one might imagine, since my journey took me to like miles of documents in the United Nations. Um, so the way that 
The way that policy actually works in cyber conflict um, is much closer to how policy works in you know, diplomacy and economic affairs. You, okay. Uh, so some of the elements here are, um, so say my, my neighbor does me, does me wrong and, uh, and injures my pride or something else, my banking industry. Uh, <laughs> my, my options are I can send uh, what's called a demarche, which is a, basically a strongly worded letter. <laughs> Um, I can impose economic penalties, and a fun fact is that uh, in most cases where countries are, you know, expressing displeasure with one another, that tends to happen at the World Trade Organization, um, and it tends to happen at the WTO for a couple of reasons. One is that there's a sort of, there is a framework that is, you know, very safe. It's, uh, you know, it's... Uh, somewhat regularized, there are observers, um, and you're not really risking any escalation. And there's a particular word for the kinds of actions that are done at the WTO, um, and the, the concept is retortion. Uh, it is a response to an injury that is proportionate and also legal. So if you, you know, impose sanctions on me, I can impose sanctions on you, that is retortion, it is non-escalatory, it is also within sort of the realm of, it is licit under international law. Um, and then I can do targeted sanctions, and I didn't realize this, but I think these points are sort of in increasing order of pettiness. <laughs> so targeted sanctions are, um, you can name individual companies, uh, individual, uh, or we usually just refer to them as entities, um, or individual people. Uh, that you know you have singled out for bad behavior, and you you know there's a certain amount of naming and shaming. Uh, a lot of sanctions, um, a lot of sanctions, I think, are more symbolic than they are meant to be effective. But sometimes it can do things like make it very uncomfortable for people to travel or um, you know do do business overseas. So this is the actual world of how nation states tend to respond to one another uh, when, there is, uh, when there is a cyber conflict. So um, the broken parts of all of this, <laughs> aside from the inability of the UN to get its act together, Um, so open source and industry analysis of nation state activities is highly fragmented. Um, the analysis tends to lack rigor. We fall into this trap where the confidence is either perfect or it is non-existent. And as I said at the beginning, um, we tend to get weak third party attribution. Um, and yeah, so confidence is 100 or zero is something we'll talk about. A, a bit more about later. Um, but these are the things that I started thinking about last November when um, I think in October Harun Mir posted something on, he wrote a blog post for Thinks about uh, the need for a Geneva Convention for Software. And <laughs> Brad Smith, the uh, president and CEO of Microsoft, has written about that several times. And I disagreed with it both times he wrote it because I thought it trivialized actual armed conflict and really misunderstand the character of international law itself. Um, and then Haroon, who is somebody that I admire and respect greatly, published the same thing. And to his great credit, he let me write a riposte to his blog post and then put it on his own blog. <laughs> Um, which was pretty great, uh, but the, you know, the whole, like the whole drift of the conversation in the last year or so has gone more and more towards, you know, people looking all over the place for an answer. Like we need the Cyber Geneva Convention. We need somebody to do a big grand thing that will get us out of this tire fire that we're in. And I think we kind of have to stop waiting for that miracle to happen because it's not going to. Um, and the sort of reality check that we need to wrap our minds around is that 
actually, yeah. So the reality check that we need to wrap our, our heads around um, is even in a perfect world where you know we could get a cyber Geneva convention, um, I kind of ran this thought experiment down uh, and the most stringently binding uh, UN resolution I could think of is UN 1540, which is uh, a legally binding resolution that is meant to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And 1540 does not explain what a new, it doesn't define what a nuclear explosion is. Like the language was that watered down. <laughs> so if we were to get everything that we wanted, it would have to be more robust, more stringent, more strict than the strictest thing that exists. Um, and in terms of just aligning expectations with what we can, you know, what we could even hope for in perfect conditions, I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, so that's the current state of the world that we live in. Um, and this, this actually, I'm, I'm going to be contrary and, and say that this is getting better. Uh, Australia has started to do some really interesting things in this space, uh, like articulate explicitly how they view certain actions in the information domain, articulate their reasoning behind their proposed responses. Um, and this sounds really boring and really clerical, but it's something that has been missing for an incredibly long time. Um, and you know, if you are on the defensive side, if you have an enterprise that you need to defend and you know that there are nation states out there that are, you know, uh, kind of <laughs> running hog wild on the internet, um, you kind of want more structure and you want this to be more pinned down. Uh, the, the sort of lack of rules has not worked very well for us so far. I have no reason to expect that things will spontaneously get better. Um, most of the time uh, when I talk to people who work on the diplomatic side, they will say things like, you know, 10 years ago, we imagined that these would be the normative red lines that we all just mutually understood and didn't really need to articulate. And every single one of those has since been blown right through. Um, and, you know, so doing nothing really didn't work out so well. Now, when it comes to the industry side, I said we were going to talk a little bit about that zero or 100 confidence thing. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not a huge fan of whataboutism. Um, and I see this a lot in nation state malware analysis. Uh, if, if we do any kind of contextual analysis beyond the strictly technical, uh, there's kind of a there's a line of thinking in information security that is like, well, who cares if it's Russia? Who cares if it's the United States? Who cares if it's GPRK? You're all as bad as each other, a pox on all your houses. And frankly, that is lazy thinking. <laughs> um, if, you, if you adopt that sort of stance and dismiss all of the other relevant evidence, um, or circumstance, the, uh, it, you, you end up at a uselessly high level of, it, of abstraction and you end up in a place where you can just dive down into, you know, <laughs> dive down into your rich headers and spend weeks wrapping, wrapping yourself around the axle of did they or didn't they or do these things match and you know, you, you end up being dismissive and obsessive at the same time, and it's just really, really bad critical thinking. And I, I owe Patrick uh, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of thanks for actually saying this on the air. Um, and he said this a lot about uh, Olympic Destroyer, um, which is you can't just rely on binary analysis to get good attribution. And it's the, con it's the contextual part that I feel like the industry has fallen down on. And I've joked to Haroon before that I don't think you should need to know diplomatic history to do root cause analysis, but the future is weird and nation states do play in this space. Um, I don't think that necessarily means we should have like historians and political scientists staffing like every single analyst shop, but we can't ignore all of it either. So 
some more about the bears. Um, <laughs> I tried to run down, just for fun, all of the names of APT28, and I was kind of on the fence about including the last one because DHS calls them Grizzly Step, but only when they're with APT29. Um, <laughs> apparently, you need two bears. Uh, so I understand why AV companies do this. I understand why shops want to put their own mark on things. But frankly, this is part of the reason why the policy scene has been so fragmented and so unable to get itself together. Because when we look for good analysis, we get this utterly fractured picture that you then have to spend weeks knitting back together. Um, and you know, I so I was here uh, from Monday for um, for Black Hoodie, and I was actually training doing <coughs> intro to RE. And you know, I understand and I empathize that analysts who work for these companies are probably on the clock to produce signatures, get them out the door, get them to customers. Like that is what they are prioritizing. Um, but it's the slow analysis that gives you the really good picture of what these threat actors do and what they target and what they care about and how they care about it. Like, I think for defense to be effective, we need less of the, you know, <laughs> we need less of the race to be like first out with the white paper and like a little bit better considered analysis. However, like the economic incentive just isn't there for that. Um, Academia is not really filling this gap very well. Uh, and you know, this is one of the things that I really don't have an answer for. I think the Hewlett Foundation in the United States uh, is aware of this problem and articulated that they understand they need to be doing better in terms of funding technically sound policy work. Um, but I also know that they have a hard time finding people to fund that fit that description. So, the problem is, like, ultimately, the picture that we should have is, like, these are all one bear. Like, same thing. Um, and there's a more, so there's, there's a concrete example of this that, like, I want to talk about, and I kind of fought with myself about it because it's fairly recent, like this past week. Um, but this was, uh, there were three pieces of reporting that were published on SecureList during uh, the Security Analyst Summit in, in Cancun. Um, this is, you know, SAS is Kaspersky's conference, SecureList is Kaspersky's, you know, basically news feed. Uh, and the write-ups on Olympic Destroyer just got under my skin a little bit. <laughs> uh, just. I don't know, audience participation. Um, how many people in the room think Olympic Destroyer was a Russian campaign? Show of hands? One person. Um, OK. Well, hang on, show of hands. How many people know what Olympic Destroyer is? Ah, OK. So Olympic Destroyer was the malware that, <laughs> that disrupted the, uh, the beginning of the, um, of the Olympics in Pyeongchang. Uh, the attribution was uh, was anonymous, but it was U.S. sourced, and it was like, no, definitely this was Russia. Um, now, it would be easy to dismiss that if it were not for the fact that the United States has helped secure every Olympics since Atlanta in 1996. Like, they've been on site in Pyeongchang setting up networks and doing security <coughs> for two years. <laughs> um, and in terms of like, in terms of being able to you know, trust that they actually had the information that they needed to make that assessment, like I'm pretty sure that they did. Uh, and also, the contextual part was like, OK, so the country that got frozen out of the Olympics and also wasn't invited to peace talks on the peninsula that they really wanted to be at might have been a little bit pissed off. Um, so the secure list pieces just annoyed me greatly because they got wound around the axle in terms of a couple of technical indicators that were like, well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, like, this could be, like, none of it was evidence against, uh, but it was presented as, we don't think it's evidence for. Um, and it was just, I think, a masterclass in whataboutism. 
Uh, for example, I think they pulled, <laughs> uh, this is from, the, the title of this piece that that slide is from was from uh, Olympic Destroyer is Here to Trick the Industry. Uh, and these were um, screen grabs of you know, pieces of code that I think uh, Cisco's Talos had identified as being similar in function between NotPetya and Olympic Destroyer. And the, <laughs> the Kaspersky write-up uh, pointed out that there were semantic differences between the, between the two pieces of code, despite the fact that they were functionally almost identical. And therefore, they didn't copy-paste it, which means that they couldn't possibly have been the same people. And it was like, have you never written, rewritten a function before? Because <laughs> like, I'm not a programmer, and I have. Uh, and so I was, I was not particularly impressed with like the quality of analysis. Um, and you know, I don't like ragging on particular shops, but this is something that I see like fairly consistently in in, in pieces on SecureList. Is you know, the the presentation was that the attribution of the Olympic uh, destroyer campaign to, uh, to Russia was, you know, just offhand, very thinly sourced, and pay no attention to the thing over there. And it's like, well, if our national cert was like on site and we built the networks that they were infiltrating, like, I'm pretty sure we probably would have known. Um, but the bigger part is just the utter ignorance of the, circum of the contextual evidence that you know, was like all signs pointing this way. Uh, there was no mention of previous campaigns by the same threat actor against the Olympics, um, from the World Anti-Doping Agency in 2016 to the IOC. Um, like, this is not the first time this has happened. And selectively pruning your evidence in order to support a narrative that the takeaway here is a doubt um, I think is one, disingenuous, and two, actively harmful. Uh, it doesn't do anybody any good to uh, you know, keep pushing this line that attribution is hard and will always be hard and it can never be perfect and therefore, like, who knows, it could have been anyone. It's like, yeah, you know, from a strict possibility perspective, perspective it could have been anyone, but it very probably <laughs> was the GRU. So, yeah, rants. Yay, rants. <laughs> um, so, I really like this quote from Jeff Lewis. Um, he said this uh, in the context of, uh, and Jeff Lewis is a, he's a um, scholar at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, which is a, a very old school non-proliferation think tank that, you know, they've been peaceniks since before it was cool. Um, and Jeff is very, very smart. And he was talking about, uh, this was in the context of, um, I think the JCPOA, the, uh, the Iran nuclear deal. And he was talking about how people can get sort of obsessed about missile technologies um, or about the peculiarities of, you know, people, people have their bits of the technology that they love to obsess about. Um, and his point was, you know, the technology is only interesting in as far as it answers a policy question. Like, does this have anything to say about the policy problem that we currently face? Uh, and, you know, since, since we, uh, since we know that like all defensive problems are political problems, um, you know, I do wonder if there's, I do wonder if we, I do wonder how good we are at focusing on the aspects of the technology that are actually interesting to the policy questions. And you can take that quite broadly, like the policy questions in terms of like, what is your own security policy and the policy questions uh, sort of at the macro level of how do nation states interact with each other in this space. Um, so, you know, if we're looking for the interesting parts of the technology, these are the sorts of things that I've been thinking about for the last couple of months um, since Harun and I had that exchange about, you know, cyber Geneva conventions. Uh, there's attribution. Um, and talking about confidence, you know, 
verification in arms control has historically been assembled from fragments of evidence from various technologies, various measurements, um, and there's a general, there is general consensus on the strengths and limits of different methods. Uh, and there is general consensus around, you know, what constitutes robust verification and what constitutes weak. Um, but again, we don't really talk about that. We don't really talk about methodology. We don't really talk about what it means when, <laughs> when you are comparing two bits of code and saying that they're not copy-pasted. <laughs> like, that's... Like, I think we could do with a little bit more structure, a little bit more rigor. Um, and there's also intent. Uh, and, you know, I, <laughs> I, fight with, um, I fight with a friend of mine who has a security company. And he is very fond of, of saying that you cannot infer intent by looking at code. He also says he would love to hire more reverse engineers who are able to infer tent intent from code because that's the mark of a really good reverser. And it's sort of like, you can't really have both. Um, so what can you infer from design? Uh, you know, what does the design of your malware say about you? Uh, <laughs> what does it mean when you have an anatomically correct piece of ransomware functioning as a wiper? You know, what does it mean when you have uh, explicit modularity or a high level of engineering that is meant for ubiquitous use? Uh, so in the case of Crash Override, for example, the ICS malware that was uh, discovered in Ukraine, also a Russian campaign. Um, spot the pattern. Uh, <laughs> like Crash Override said, Crash Override signaled something very different from Stuxnet. Stuxnet was designed for one true love, and that one true love was the facility at Natanz. Uh, Crash Override was designed to have modules swapped in and out that would enable it to be used pretty much anywhere. Um, and in terms of signaling, those two pieces of malware sent very, very different messages. Um, and this is how nation states sort of talk to each other, uh, which is utterly bizarre, but nation states are weird and also drama queens. Um, <laughs> so in terms of like, in terms of how we do malware analysis, uh, I think knitting together observations that you can draw from what nation states say on plein air um, in fora like the WTO or at the UN, where, you know, <laughs> like at one point Russia put together this like eight, 10 page document proposing like a code of conduct for uh, norms of behavior of states in cyberspace. And it was basically the playbook for information and influence operations. It was all about um, it was also it was all about uh, mass manipulation of the populace and subversion of the national psyche and uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation and but it was focused on the it was focused on the informatic aspect and it was focused on the way that information can be leveraged in order to exert a controlling influence over not necessarily about you know, not necessarily focused on how you can use the cybers to blow things up, which is kind of more what the Americans understood. Um, so when we look at when we look at nation state campaigns and we look at nation state malware, I think it's important to try to bring in that contextual element. <laughs> like again, I don't expect all of us to become political scientists. I, in fact, I think that would be a horrible idea. Um, but we also can't be ignorant of it either, uh, because it is actively harmful. Like there is such a deficit of this thinking that it is doing actual harm, um, and it's also preventing movement in places that we need there to be movement. Um, so I think my two pieces are, you know, sort of having better contextual analysis of nation-state campaigns, but also having, you know, maybe a deep look inside about how we do analysis methodologically and wondering like, could we be a little bit more rigorous? Could we be a little bit more explicit in how we are doing these assessments? And no, I understand that like no, <laughs> no threat intel shop, no AV shop is going to like publish their secret sauce or you know, their fancy machine learning algorithms. But I still think we can do better. 
is it's not just those places that have to do this, right? Um, so the other interesting stuff is going to be your thoughts there. Um, like, I am around for the next two and a half, three days, uh, if anybody wants to chat. Um, and I'm going to leave my contact information up and plenty of time for questions, because that's the fun part for me. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, yep. that was fast. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, question starting off with crash override as an example. Mm -hmm. which I worked on, so thank Neat. you for bringing that up and using that name. <laughs> um, but in that specific case, it was almost obvious to say that oh, this is Russia for a number of reasons. Sure. Um, other cases less obvious. In looking at it from an analytical perspective, I could have spent time reading that back to tie it to, say, Sandworm or some other mm -hmm. activity or whatever to strengthen that relationship. But I look at it from the perspective of like, well, this is a modular framework that could be repurposed, reused, and now that the code is out there, others can use it. I'm going to focus on how it worked, and I'm not going to care about who did, because I'm looking at this from how do I defend against it. So from your perspective, you're taking a slightly different view than I am. Mm -hmm. What do I gain, or what does the defender gain from delineating the who behind the action as opposed to just the how part? Um, so I think what you gain is so both nation states and criminal organizations have particular interests. They want particular things. They value particular assets that they target, and they have a certain modus operandi. They also, like, if you're a nation state, you also have a particular understanding of you know, what is safe to execute in cyberspace in terms of international law. So for example, uh, the who would matter um, because you want to know whether or not it's a nation state actor that is you know, that has stretched its legs in this space before. Um, Russia, in particular, has been quite adventurous in terms of flirting with that line in, in terms of the law of armed conflict. Like, there are uh, campaigns that they've executed inside of actual hot conflicts. So I would definitely ascribe, like, a higher, <laughs> you know, danger quotient to that. Um, but if you've got a relatively immature nation state power, they usually start off doing things like DDoS attacks um, because that is unambiguously not a violation of international law. You're not breaking anything. You're, you know, you're, you've got a weapon of mass annoyance. <laughs> um, so there are, there are sort of phases of development that nation state powers go through. Um, and if you know who is targeting you, you may also have a better idea of what they want. Um, or what is important to them. Um, and in terms of, I actually think that this is part of doing asset inventory and management. Uh, you should understand like, whether or not you are interesting um, to either various kinds of criminal brokers or various kinds of nation state groups. Um, like Knowing that someone is going to come for you is probably a good thing to figure out. <laughs> but that's, that's about what I would get out of it. <coughs> So the, the, the proposal from Russians mm -hmm. that you mentioned as mm -hmm. a playbook, mm -hmm. is there any way you would be willing to share that? Oh, yeah, I'm going to upload that to the okay. GitHub repository. And, and also, <laughs> uh, is there any like work you did that, you, that is written down about the, the analysis you did on the whole uh, history of the United? I'm still writing that up as a part okay. two to the, the piece that I did back in November. Um, I thought it would take a lot less time than it did, but it turns out that people at the UN talk a lot. <laughs> Would be interesting to me. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, uh, my question, I guess, is: Is there a one information place so and get uh, ideas around what different nation states actually want, and then how to defend against or how to identify which assets a different nation state might be interested in? Uh, yeah, so um, one, will be, one will be the raw material in the repository that I'll upload. Um, the other one, though, is I highly recommend if you do anything defensive or any defensive research is MISP. It's the malware information sharing platform. Uh, there are MISP galaxies uh, that cluster, um, that cluster uh, around threat actors. Uh, 
So you can actually look, and some of them are tagged by country, like they will give state, they will give state affiliations. Um, and it's one of the best places that I've found that sort of has hoovered all of that together. Uh, so I think by clicking through like those campaigns, you could start to draw like a pretty robust map. Um, and that feature of MISP I think is relatively new. Like it's still being fleshed out, but it's new within the last like six months. Um, yeah, awesome talk. Uh, so I've seen on Twitter, maybe it's just isolated to Twitter as far as thinking, but I've definitely seen people critique, particularly when the US comes out with some sort of attribution because they say that you're giving up certain like intelligence collection methods or certain types of analysis, I guess. What's your view on any potential downsides of like very publicly attributing or releasing, as you said, more information around it? Yeah, so, uh, so for the... After the uh, interference in the U.S. 2016 election, um, the Department of Homeland Security, in um, like in partnership with the FBI, published that first sort of technical report that was a really thin, like 12-page document that m people were just like, "What is this?" Um, and it took them, I think, another two or three months to update that to like a technical document that was more or less accepted as like, "Okay, this looks like something that I would actually." that I can do something with and that I would respect. Um, I think the US intelligence community is incredibly cautious and like in many cases would rather die than risk sources and methods. Uh, and frankly, I think that our peer adversaries exploit that fact. Um, so they're, <laughs> You know, there's there's always a happy medium, uh, and the fact that they were able to get to that second technical report at all just tells me that like, you can get there. You just need to get there faster. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, why not? Um, so I think we have the problem that while there is the the positive. Uh, discussion around defensive security. We also have to get away from the purely technical aspects of it. So how do we frame a discussion on political subjects of defensive security without people dismissing it as non-technical? Um, that's a good question. I mean, the fact that I, the fact that troopers let me give this talk is a good is a good step. Um, <laughs> but I think the. Uh, so the okay, so you can have all of the technical like you can have all of the technical detail in the world. Uh, you can have perfect technical information. If you don't understand the political context, like that is the world of what is practicable. Like that is the world of everything you can actually do. Um, and if you if you neglect that, it's like okay, well, in theory, in the technical world, it's like that is possible. But the political world balances that out with like actually these are the constraints, and here is what is most likely to happen. I mean, maybe as an additional step, we can set up a panel with the croc next year. <laughs> <laughs> so to follow up on that, and also to do sort of reverse order, since he, I asked before he did last time, and we do some sort of pattern here. So yes, I agree with what you said there, that having that, you know, the, what's part of practical, mm -hmm. and take the Olympic destroyer example. As an organization, and also to reference the, your answer from earlier, they should have been prepared that someone it will likely try to disrupt their network. And if you look at the, not copy pasted from not Petya, but functionally, anatomically quite similar, um, <laughs> and not only that, but quite similar to a lot of things that you see in ransomware and other sorts of things, like, well, that should stick out. But you can get that level of intentionality by looking at the code itself, which is a good thing not to let people off the hook on that, no, this is disruptive, this is ransomware, this is a data mm -hmm. stealer. But then going the extra step then, uh, like, well, I know that someone may pursue a disruptive act against me to elevate that one step higher then to like, but it's going to be one of these three people. It's going to be either North Korea, except they were not no longer pissed off because they were invited to the party and everything. Russia was not invited to the party, so yeah. maybe a little more pissed off. Or who the hell knows? Anonymous is back into the game now and all of a sudden got significantly better technical chops. Who knows? But you know, at that level then, what do you get by pushing the envelope that much further than from the intention that this will likely happen to my organization to, and you know, this is the actor that's going to carry that activity out then? 
So that's, I'm really glad you asked that question because what I have seen happen is a really pernicious feedback loop. Uh, so when representatives of states try to negotiate with each other about norms formation and about codes of conduct, if you have a state that is able to say, well, I, I haven't seen any industry analysis, what does the industry say? Uh, and if the industry is sort of waffling about like, well, the technical thing says this, and you know, it is this class of attack, not necessarily this actor, um, so long as the industry remains sort of fuzzy on how far it's willing to take uh, attribution, um, it, that is providing cover for bad state actors. <laughs> Um, like that is, it has gotten to the point where that is actively harmful and where nation states have figured this out and they are actively exploiting it. Um, I actually have a question from a colleague. Um, <laughs> so uh, he wanted to know if misdirection was mentioned. Uh, attackers pivoting through diplomatically challenging countries would be my go-to as it introduces extra challenges for the defender. What are your thoughts? Uh, pivoting through diplomatically challenging countries? Um, I guess you could, like... I think like false flagging and... Oh, oh, right. Um, yeah, so false flagging is not as much of a, like, I would call it false-ish flagging <laughs> at, at this point, because, uh, so when nation states do this, they, when a nation state false flags an operation uh, like Olympic Destroyer, you don't want to do it too well, because if you do it too well, you risk a war on the Korean Peninsula, which is a tiny bit unstable. Um, and like, there is a certain, uh, you know, one hopes that there is a certain norm of restraint <laughs> against like trying to be too good. Um, right now, I would call false flagging cute um, and kind of a dick move, but <laughs> like, it's, you know, it's not, I would say that if they were sincerely trying to do it, they would have done better. Uh, and this is sort of, uh, you know, there is there is signaling going on with the um, there is signaling in the defects of these campaigns as well as in the success in the successes. I also I also really like that you're taking the most questions now. Go yeah. Um, Pure comments. Thank you mm -hmm. for your talk. It's been interesting. Um, the first one, uh, I guess you're familiar with the saying, cock up before conspiracy. Um, yeah. And the, the list of companies you showed, I don't work for any of them, so I, I'm free to comment on those, but uh, many of those companies, it's like um, those guys, they're building apart, apartments through a mail slot. Um, the, because the, they are the only thing, if, if the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And, and those guys are very often working with very limited samples. They are getting maybe some binaries or they are getting maybe some logs or, or, or something, some sort of artifacts. But they, don't, they are lacking context completely. Yeah. And I, I've seen it firsthand that basically you're, you're missing so much information that it's impossible to do any sort of reasonable attribution. Um, and and then, as a as a comment to that, uh, also <coughs> based on my personal experience, the best way to do attribution is actually if you have access to the data that was stolen, because then it usually makes sense. You, when you take a look at the data, you you can kind of figure out okay who would benefit from this, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's usually a good indication of who might be behind it. So those are just my two cents. Sure, and you know, uh, again, part of the problem is that um, we have uh, we have an unmet need between industry and academia for that high level of good, robust contextual analysis with a rigorous methodological framework. Like that just doesn't exist, really. Um, and you know, as I said, like I recognize and I empathize with the fact that a lot of the people who write these reports are literally under the gun to get <coughs> stuff out the door, and you know, you run strings and hash and go. Um, like that's about it. <laughs> but there's there is uh, definitely a <laughs> there's definitely a need there that is uh, not being satisfied. <laughs> 
a short follow-up as well. I think last year we had the roundtable on attribution, didn't we? So if yes. you want to see how you can like start a discussion with technical people on that, um, Kai might be a good discussion partner if you just turn around and maybe want to grab him. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, that one slide that you had about this lazy thinking, which you criticized, I, I don't know if I'm I, if I fully understood it. Like in my daily job, initially I don't necessarily have to worry about like the, the attribution, like who actually mm -hmm. caused the collateral damage or the outages in my ICS environments. Would you say that this is too lazy of my thinking because I, I stopped caring actually where it came from. I just have to be make sure that I'm not the collateral victim of the shit that's going out there on there. Where I'm not even, you know, I'm not even targeted. I'm just, I'm just at the wrong time, the wrong place, and I just grabbed this malware because of some coincidence. So I wouldn't say I. I was speaking more in the context of like when when people do decide that they are going to do attribution and they get wrapped around the well, what about this? What about that? Could have been anything. Might as well just give up. Okay, so um, easy thinking in the context of attribution. Yeah, yeah, but I would say that in. In an ICS context, you know, I, I would care very much about attribution, even if it was sort of bystander or collateral, uh, just because uh, most governments care when their ICS providers or yeah. or operators are are affected. And uh, you know, again, if they don't hear from industry that there are problems or what the specific nature of the problems are, uh, that again just leaves it open for you know when they do have high level discussions. It's like, well, I don't. I don't hear anything. It must not be a problem. Uh, okay. Yep. Interesting. Thanks. Okay. Slowly coming to an end. Yeah, I suspect we're probably about out of time. Yes. That's perfect timing now. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's thank Mara again. Oh, thank you.